Chapter Thirteen of A Water Biography by Robert C. Leslie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Thirteen Difficulty of Getting a Boat Hear of One at Oakham's The Way There I See the Lily Fall in Love with Her She Becomes Mine Not a Young Boat But Cheap Her Birth Parentage Etc. A Good Boat Compared with a Horse advantages of boat over horse safety of modern lead-keeled racers etc southampton water large boats easy to handle there my lady friend and her ten tonner my third boy takes his sister's place at the tiller precaution against his getting overboard fishing i start a beam trawl net drawbacks and pleasures of the sport steering with the trawl warp i am knocked overboard my boy does not care i got inside my boat again an old watch still ticking a cold bath watch all right again it parts its cable one day and takes a bath alone is recovered how to treat a watch after being four hours in the sea the lily in winter quarters fitting out at oakum's energetic skippers sugar its effect on them work to be done how to judge of it ready for sea london owners weather its effect upon fitting out the beginning of the end after trying in vain to repurchase my half-decked boat the water spaniel and finding nothing suitable for sale among the boat yards on the itchen i turned my attention to oakum's yard where from information obtained quite independently of the great oakum himself i hoped to find a certain pretty little fishing boat for sale any reader in quest of a boat for sale or hire has only to walk down the main street of our great seaport until where it ends in a broad expanse of quay he can go no further by land and keeping along the quay to the right he will find a narrow lane leading toward a low archway or water gate built so mr murray tells us in the eleventh century beyond this gate right facing you stands a little white clench-built wooden house with bright green window shutters that evidently once were cabin doors this is the private residence of mr oakum to the right of it a small wicket also an old cabin door leads into his yard where lie clustered like a flock of seabirds at rest a number of small yachts hauled up in winter quarters the boat i expected to find was not however hauled up in the yard but moored just beyond it at a little dock which in the days when southampton was frequented by the quality as a watering place had been built for a sea-water bath a glance at the lily as she lay afloat here was enough to tell me that she was one of the fastest little half-decked boats in the port her owner 
who had no further use for her, was anxious to sell. She was, therefore, at once taken out of the dock, and after a close survey became mine at the low price of fifteen pounds. She must have been cheap, because the day after her purchase, Mr. Oakham said he would have given more for her to sell again. The lily was a nineteen-foot itchin ferry fishing boat, and when I bought her must have been nearly thirty years old, her name appearing as a winner of prizes in regattas for twenty-eight years. But having been faithfully built of the best material by Alfred Payne for an experienced waterman, she was still almost as sound in plank and timber as when she left his yard. She was built before the days of outside lead ballast, but had four hundredweight of iron on her keel and a ton inside. Her sails were old, but lasted me nearly two seasons. After some years of selfish indulgence in boat sailing, a fast, powerful boat becomes as necessary to a man as a means of outdoor exercise as a good horse. In her, with a fresh breeze, he can always enjoy and be sure of a few hours' gallop over the nearest stretch of broad salt water. A boat is quite as much a companion as a horse, while, after a short acquaintance with one, there is all the difference between sailing in her and a hired one as there is between riding your own cob and one from a livery stable. Though sometimes advised to do so by sarcastic pedestrians, you cannot get inside your horse as you can a boat's cuddy in a shower. While, though a boat like Lily will do anything you ask of her but speak, she is, unlike a horse, devoid of foolish nervous fear. When I first began boating in the early forties, what is now called single-handed cruising was almost unknown among amateurs. And though a far less risky outdoor recreation than hunting, or than even riding along a turnpike road, people had a curious vague dread of it. Much of this has passed away, and hundreds of amateur boatmen, and even ladies, are now as much at home and really safer in a sailing boat than they would be on the back of a hunter or bicycle. Outside lead ballast has had something to do with this by having made it almost impossible to capsize a boat, while if sufficiently decked or covered in so that the water cannot get below, the smallest modern racer or pleasure boat is as uncapsizable and unsinkable as a boy's toy model, which, even if placed in the water mass downwards, will at once turn right side up again. Boats of this sort, when I was young, were unknown, and one had then to look out for squalls, and take care of a boat in one. Now I often say that my boat, with a ton of outside lead, looks out for herself and takes care of me in a squall. Southampton water is essentially a comfortable, single-handed cruising ground, even for old men. While, owing to its landlocked character, Boating may be indulged in upon it in almost any weather which a mast or canvas will stand to. The short steep sea which gets up in all tidal waters with the wind against the tide 
is admirably provided against in the class of boat used upon them like the lily half decked in ford and with broad waterways round the open well room or cockpit aft up to certain limits the size of a boat for cruising in such waters is immaterial and i have a lady friend who for years has handled her ten-ton cutter during long day cruises in southampton water and the solent with the help only of one man nearly seventy years old soon after returning to southampton my youngest boy took his sister's place on board my boat he began boating indeed so early in life that when alone with him in the boat i always tied the end of a rope round his middle in case of his scrambling overboard he objected at first to this but until able to swim it was not safe to leave him a moment in the cockpit aft without taking this precaution manny as we called him and i had many long cruises together and though not an ardent fisherman myself i used generally to contrive something of the kind for him at one end or another of a cruise having been built as a fishing boat the lily had a regular trawl deck aft and a year or two after i bought her i fitted up a small beam trawl net for her which though it seldom added much to the family supply of fish when it went down to the sea always brought to light many strange wonders of the deep and was an inexhaustible source of amusement to my little boy while on the coldest day the work it entailed was more than enough to keep one warm this was especially the case when the net got hold of what the fishermen call a tarrack or a large bit of decayed timber not uncommon in southampton water being it is supposed the remains of a submerged forest when this happened the boat was brought up suddenly with the full strength of the tide running past her and to release the net or lift what it had fouled the tow-rope had to be at once taken forward in the boat which was then if possible sailed over the net in the opposite direction it had just been towed at times even this failed to release the net and the boat's main halyard tackle had to be used to lift it and the tarrack from the bottom sometimes the net would all at once become filled to the mouth with a kind of seaweed and after being raised with difficulty to the surface had to be emptied alongside by hoisting the small end up by the halyards old or unbuoyed moorings or anchors were also a source of anxiety and trouble in trawling manny was however too young to care for or share these drawbacks to the sport with me and when after a twenty minutes haul the white underside of a few flat fish or the silver scales of a good-sized bass gleamed through the dark meshes of our net as it came in on the trawl deck his delight was enough to compensate me for much hard work when a trawl is down at work the boat is steered almost entirely by the position of the warp over her stern or one quarter by shifting it a little forward she is brought to the wind and by taking it from one quarter over her stern to the other she may be jibed round before the wind on the other tack it was in doing this that one day i was knocked overboard by the main sheet blocks and found myself outside my boat astern of her in the water 
with my little boy alone in her. He was hardly tall enough to see over the sides of the cockpit. But when I first came up, I told him, in order to check her speed, to try and haul the foresheet over to windward. But recollecting instantly that having jibed it was already in that position, I said, All right, Manny, let it alone. Luckily, the lily was not going fast, and getting hold of the trawl warp some distance astern, I soon hauled myself alongside and climbed on board again by the main sheet tackle which had knocked me out of her. I felt light enough in the water, but like a lump of lead in my wet clothes when I tried to rise out of it. On getting on to the trawl deck, the first thing I did was to pull out my watch, and finding, thanks to a tight case and close-fitting pocket, it was still going, I gave it to Manny to hang up in the cuddy. This was the only time during a long boating experience that I can say I owed my life to being able to swim. I was pleased at the composed way Manny took the incident, and to show him that it was a matter of no importance, I hauled in the net at once and lowered it again for a fresh haul. The day was fine and warm, and by the time we had made the next haul and my clothes were nearly dry, Manny, like a kitten at play, had entirely forgotten the whole business. Since then I have once been accidentally in the water outside my boat. But it happened in port when a short dinghy turned head over heels as I stepped forward in her to alter the position of the lily before docking her for scrubbing. I was alone, and the time of year and day, November, 7 a.m., with a sharp white frost, made a retreat homewards desirable. I did not forget my old watch, and as soon as I was out of the water, it was out of my pocket and hanging dry, and still ticking inside the cuddy while I walked home for a change. This watch, however, some years later, had a longer salt-water bath, when, in stooping over forward, to clear my boat's bobstay of a small boat's gunwale, it flew out of my pocket, and the chain, after taking a half-turn round the bowsprit shroud, snapped, leaving the watch to go plump to the bottom alone in eight feet of water. This happened close to a quay, and an old waterman standing on it remarked, "'Never mind, sir!' we knows where she be don't say nothing to nobody and you'll ever again at low water which i did four hours afterwards and thanks to a sound constitution in that old chronometer watch built in london six years before i was born is going now and has kept good time ever since its last sea bath eight years ago. After this incident, I took care, however, to fit it with a stout hemp cable of Hambro line, in place of the silver chain. Boating friends, who had had watches wet inside with seawater, assured me that mine was ruined. But I always found that they had allowed their watches to dry, before placing them in the hands of the doctor. This, if possible, should never take place, and a watch into which sea or any other water has penetrated should always be kept immersed in fresh water or oil until it can be placed in the hands of a watchmaker. About the end of October, the lily nearly always returned to her old haunt, and was carefully hauled up in Oakham's yard. 
Five and twenty years ago, when I first knew the place, not half a dozen private boats or small yachts made use of it as winter quarters, while none of them exceeded ten tons. Oakham has now been dead many years, and under his successor the business has so increased that there is hardly a square foot to spare today among the yachts hauled up there in winter. But long after the decease of Mr. Oakham, his name and certain old traditions, I, among others, hung about the yard, and every year as spring advances, signs and sounds among the yachts indicate that more than one enthusiastic yachtsman has already given orders to fit out. Some days before such sounds are heard, burly skippers cruise round with smudgy telegrams, seeking counsel and advice from others of their class as to the meaning and answer required to a short message, such as, get mermaid ready for sea at once wire time required it matters little whether a craft be three or thirty tons as to the answer her owner is likely to get while as the skipper has to go over every detail of the job with three or more brother skippers before he composes his telegram the owner seldom receives a ply earlier than the following morning it's no good goin an over fist about a job or to go and tell a gent three weeks and then have half the work to do again but now and then an energetic skipper after a few hours deliberation and a long consultation with the great oakum himself has been known to wire a reply to his owner the same day weather permittin by about fust of next month should the craft be a large one say of thirty tons the first few days of fitting out are devoted by the skipper to a private survey held either on the sunny side of her or weather not permitting of that before the forecastle fire which is always started by her skipper early in the business of fitting out in order to hair things up a bit but wherever he may select to hold this important survey the skipper if the crew is to be chosen by him becomes at once an important focus of attention to the loungers about oakum's the first great points to be settled are the probable length of the commission the wages per month and what his gent finds in the way of clothing long before all these details are arranged the skipper has accumulated quite a handful of pink telegrams each of which has to be read before he answers the latest one in this way the first few days of fitting out pass pleasantly away and towards the end of the first week when what is known as some sugar in the shape of owner's money arrives everybody's grog is sweetened by it and a resolution put by the skipper is carried by the crew in the parlor of the union jack that it is too late in the week to make a start to-day but that all hands are to turn up early on monday morning the captain of a very small yacht may as was the case with the lily represent the whole crew but as these little cutters generally have at least as many ropes blocks etc about them as a big one and each one of these has to be overhauled scraped and varnished by one man it may happen that the fit-out of a little three-tonner will take as long as or longer than a big one before the day comes that 
with every spar rope and block in place she lies ready for sea on her cradle the sun glancing off her polished sides as from the panels of a new carriage we always say ready for sea at oakham's though many of our little fleet seldom venture beyond the mouth of our port still there is a feeling on board such vessels that this is only a matter of taste and when one of the smaller craft with her condensed crew of skipper and owner does not turn up at her moorings before dark such a yacht is spoken of in our yachting circles and even at times reported in the shipping news of yachting papers as the blank mr a b cruising london yachting men are often great fidgets and think nothing of a run down at easter by train from town to disturb the calm of oakum's by a grumble at the progress invisible to the naked eye in the decorative external repairs of their craft in a paltry three weeks i used even to do so until by doing most of my own work i found out how much there was to do and the time it took to do it now i often wonder that the annual fiddling ornamental toilet of a yacht ever gets finished at all two quite opposite kinds of weather are required for different stages of the work for a mast scraping painting or caulking operations it can hardly be too fine and dry while during the removal of the winter coat of rough varnish from the deck the skipper rejoices in a small drizzling rain which keeps a certain caustic composition known to yachtsmen by the mysterious name of skewgy mugy damp and active under the scrubbing brushes of her crew so that while one crew are splashing about on a wet day with buckets and their trousers rolled up to their knees scrubbing decks the mate of the next ship hangs aloft on a masthead stool grumbling at the rain as he scrapes a winter jacket of white or red lead and tallow from his mast maybe his growls are a little qualified at times when he sees that the result of his work is drifting and falling upon the fresh scrubbed deck of his rival the mermaid what's he got to do with where the stuff falls he didn't make the wind and rain did he and wishes they were somewhere else on these wet days however there are always plenty of choice little hole and carnage jobs so to say for the skipper himself to enjoy a pipe over if so disposed in dry corners of oakum stores such as scraping block pins pointing or knotting a rope's end serving rigging etc and unless he be one of that hard class of old smacksmen who are never happy but when half wet to the skin there he will be found attended by a small knot of those talented men who always appear to make a comfortable living in such places by looking on as long as he is ashore no skipper however is safe from the telegraph boy or at last a message comes from london rapidly followed by the owner himself with all his sea traps at the nearest station to oakum's where he is met by his overworked skipper in full uniform and from that time his days of useful work or play at oakum's are numbered end of chapter thirteen